Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Scott here. It is May 1st, if you can believe it. And it feels like May 1st outside this morning. It is cool. It's a cool, brisk morning, although the sun is shining. And I hope that you're able to maybe get out and enjoy it a little bit today. Um, a lot of people really enjoy this time of year. I do until the pollen starts to set in heavily, although I think the pollen's already started to set in. But for whatever reason, it hasn't really made me sneeze a whole lot yet. Uh, but I'm sure it will here very soon. Uh, that being said, we are continuing our study through uh, Graham Goldsworthy's According to Plan, the Unfolding Revelation of God in the Bible, and uh, we are all the way into uh, chapter 7 of the book, um, which is the last chapter in the first uh, section of the book. So um, so we're, we're making good progress here, and I hope that you're enjoying uh, this study. I, I know that it's, it's a little bit deep, um, a little bit... Uh, kind of theoretical and philosophical, perhaps. Um, a lot of focus on hermeneutics and how we know what we know and what approach we should take when we come to the study of the Bible. And so I know that when you're talking about a lot of theoretical stuff, uh, it can it can feel like you're getting bogged down in it. So if you're watching this and you're going to watch until the end, I certainly appreciate your patience with it. I'm going to try to keep things as uh, simple and um, not simple in the sense that you can't handle it. I mean, i I heard a preacher say one time, um, assume that your people are extremely smart, um, but also many of them might be ignorant. So very smart, but they need you to teach them, you know, so capable, but they need you to help them. And so that's why I kind of do these deeper studies, because I, I believe that the church is extremely smart. First Baptist Church is, is not ignorant in the least. Uh, a lot, I mean, I'd say most of our people are very well taught have been uh, studying for a long time. And because of that, I think that we can handle these kind of studies. But I do want to try to make sure that I'm keeping it accessible and uh, taking it from the top shelf and bringing it down uh, to the level of the normal, you know, the, the normal person, normal thinker um, uh, for whoever might be watching. That being said, enough small talk. I want to rehash quickly uh, the last, the first uh, five or six chapters here before we get into chapter seven very quickly. Um, in this study, we've been learning about our need to flip God and nature around in our thinking. Um, the way that our thinking naturally tends to be since the fall, and I would say that over the course of modernity, it has come back post-Christendom, because in Christendom it was lost for a while so that God became the center of our thinking. But since modernity has come in, we've gone back to kind of our natural way of thinking since the fall. Um, the way that our thinking is, we, we filter our knowledge of God if we believe in God through the filter of nature so that, so that we kind of have a naturalistic way of thinking uh, whereby what we can what we can see, what we can feel, what we can sense, that's what we trust. And what we can't see, feel, or sense, that's what we don't trust. So supernatural things, that is God and spiritual matters, all of that, those are meant to be uh, put through a filter of natural things and uh, met with skepticism uh, because we can't really know those things for sure, but we can know nature for sure. And that's actually a very modernistic way of thinking, and I would say that it's the uh, maturation of the thinking that characterizes humanity since the fall. What we want is to flip it around so that we, instead of thinking of God in natural terms, we think of nature in terms of what God would have us think about it, uh, how God wants us to think. And um, since Christ calls himself the truth, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the idea here is that since he comes into the world and he is the one who shows us what's true, what's right, what's good, um, he gives us a new and redeemed way of thinking. In other, we could even put it like in these kind of strong terms, he's the one who's supposed to interpret facts for us. Uh, we want, we want, we need Christ to interpret facts for us. Chapters one to five of the book had shown us why we need this theologically. Ever since the fall, um, we we get to a point now where we suppress the knowledge of God and, and think of things as autonomous human beings. Descartes, I think it was, who said, "I think, therefore I am," and almost all of moder modernity follows that way of thinking. What we need is Christ to bring us back to clarity about what's true and what's right and what's good. And he can do this, and indeed he does do this. Um, so that, so we, we need that. We need his truth. Chapter 6, 
uh, we talked about Scripture as the divine human word. And I won't say a whole lot about this other than uh, just a comment about literalistic versus literal interpretation. Literalistic interpretation is when a person studies the Scriptures, especially um, prophetic writings, uh, apocalyptic end times writings or whatever, and assumes that um, assumes that meaning that meaning is supposed to uh, be given to us exactly how it is said. So if a word is or if a statement is given to us, it must mean exactly what it says that it means. Um, one example being when Daniel talks about the 72 weeks, um, that must literally mean 72 weeks um, because that's exactly what it says. The problem is that God says that when he speaks through the prophets, he speaks in parables, he speaks in mysteries and in illusions and not illusions. That's, that's a bad way to say it, but he, he even says that these things are, that the things that he says through the prophets are meant to be understood, um, not in exactly the way that they are spoken, but that he's giving the prophets pictures and things to tell the people to heighten their awareness so that they will then pay attention, but the fulfillment might not come exactly as it seems as it was said to. So the 72 weeks, if you interpret it literally, uh, you have a problem because the things that Daniel was promising happened um, in the first century uh, AD, the things that he was talking about, and the 72 weeks, um, you know, barely a year and a half, I mean, not even a year and a half, um, is 72 weeks, that, that doesn't fit the time frame of what Daniel was saying. So we just want to be, literalistic interpretation would say exactly how it is said is how it is meant. Literal interpretation, and this is the what I think should be conservative hermeneutics, is that meaning is found in what is meant in the, in the statement. So instead of meaning in exactly what is said, there might be a deeper meaning to it, meaning is found in exactly what is meant. And so it's like, well, pastor, how do we know what's meant? I mean, you're saying that exactly what is said is not exactly what is meant all the time. Uh, how do we find what is meant? That's what we need the whole Bible for. That's what we need biblical theology for. That's what we need the scriptures overall, the big picture for, to help us to understand the particulars in light of the bigger picture, uh, in light of the whole. Um, so that being said, moving into chapter 7, it's entitled, We Begin and End with Christ. We Begin and End with Christ. And uh, Goldsworthy talks there about how all through the scriptures, especially, I mean, especially in the New Testament, Christ is referred to in very superlative terms. Superlative terms. Um, there is no idea that he is just this lowly individual uh, who is one option among many gods to worship. But when you look at how the New Testament presents him, he's the creator. He's the creator of all things. John 1, through him were all things made. Without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, all things were made through him and for him, meaning that he's the goal and the end of all of God's creation. Furthermore, uh, in Revelation, uh, multiple times he's referred to as the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Um, and by the way, the word alphabet comes from the first two letters in the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta. Uh, but alpha and omega, those are the first and last letters. He's the beginning, he's the end, he's the first, he's the last. Revelation 1, 8 and 17, Revelation 22 and 13. The, the point being that he is the center of all things. All things come from him and all things are meant to end and terminate in him. And so since we find, according to the New Testament... Our, our identity in terms of our union with Christ. So Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, we're seated with Christ. 1 John 5, 20, we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, it is He and He alone who must give us our meaning and our purpose and must define our significance in terms of our relationship uh, with Him. Uh, so he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the, the ruler, the king of all things. And since we are united with him, that is meant to determine not only how we think of ourselves and the world around us, but how we interpret meaning, how we understand things. Um, remember Jesus saying to the disciples uh, in what's called the Great Commission, Matthew 28, all authority is mine. So as you go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teach them to observe all my word, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. It's a Christ-centered view of life and reality. I've got all authority. You go and tell people about me and have the promise um, on your heart that I'm with you until the end of the age. So the point is this. He is meant to be the link between the Bible and ourselves, every part. We approach the book of Nehemiah through Christ, right? We approach Genesis through Christ. We approach Zephaniah through Christ. We interpret Revelation uh, through Christ because he indeed is the one who is our filter of reality and of all of our thought. Um, That's another piece is that it's not just that he is the one who shows us how to approach scriptures. He he shows us, as I've already said, how to approach all of our lives and all of reality. Uh, It's not just that we have a personal investment with him so that he's our Lord, although he is, but that we believe he is is the truth itself. Um, So I'm the truth. He says, if you follow me, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. In particular, the emphasis for how we engage with Jesus Uh, is the gospel itself. So we engage with the world and thinking and everything through Jesus, but we engage with Jesus through the facts of the gospel itself. And what is the gospel if the gospel is not the message about Christ and what he did to restore us to a right relationship with God? That's the gospel. What he has done for us to reconcile us and to bring us to God. So there's a doctrinal consideration Uh, here focused on what the gospel is Um, and and the reason I bring this up is because this is contrary to what's been called uh, red letter Christianity red letter Christianity is a type of kind of socially conscious Christianity that emphasizes the direct words of Jesus in the gospels in the Bible over and above everything else in the Bible and what this is aimed to do at least as far as I can tell is um, is focus on social needs because Jesus was very focused on um, you know the, the real the real need to uh, to see the kingdom coming in the world through him and so we want to emphasize that that's not to say that he's not focused on doctrine just read the gospels he's telling people what they need to believe and what they need to think all the time um, but but what people are doing with red letter Christianity is they're They're acting as though Jesus was only concerned with social matters, and then they're isolating the particular statements that he gave towards social matters and saying that that's over and above everything else. Um, The sweep of Scripture, and especially the New Testament, is the doctrine of the gospel, the cross, the resurrection, what that means for us. Um, that's supposed to be the filter through which we even approach Jesus, who then gives us the filter through which we can approach everything else uh, in our lives. So all the meaning, all meaning is found in our relationship to Him, um, and true meaning is sought in the shadow of the cross always. So, so we approach life with Jesus overshadowing it. We approach Jesus with the cross overshadowing our approach to him. That's what, that's what Luther called the theology of the cross. Um, uh, you know, generally speaking here, uh, that, all, um, that all that we think is in the shadow of the cross and Christ-centered thinking uh, is in the shadow of the cross. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, I came to you and all I preached was Christ crucified so that your trust wouldn't be in the wisdom of man but in uh, the work of the Holy Spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit is to Um, elevate Jesus in his glory through what he's done for us at the cross. Um, So all all of this is to say, again, Christ is supposed to be the center of our thinking, uh, the lens through which we view reality, and how we approach Jesus is through the content of the gospel, what he's done to reconcile us to God, his living the righteous life, dying the sinner's death on the cross in our place, his rising from the dead, ascending Uh, then sending the Holy Spirit to us so that he is himself the filter of all of our reality because he's the truth. As we establish Christ and his gospel as the center of biblical theology, therefore, we can now deal with um, what could be called kind of the technical elements of exegesis. And I understand that it sounds like I'm already being pretty technical as it is, um, but uh, and I understand that you know a lot of this is a lot of theory and everything, but I don't I don't think it's necessarily just theoretical to talk about Jesus as the center of our thinking. But that being said, now that we've already said all of this, we've seen that Jesus is the center of all things. 
some more kind of technical aspects of, um, of biblical interpretation uh, are work. Now we can actually get into them and now we can think about them a little bit. First, we want to uh, bear in mind there are three of these literary considerations. Um, the Bible is a book. It's not like any other book, of course, but it is indeed a book and a collection of books. Uh, literary considerations um, uh, mean this, that we are seeking the meaning of the very words used in Scripture. Again, as I said earlier, how they are meant. So um, we are seeking the meaning of the very words used in Scripture, how they are meant. We want to bear in mind this is more about the divine author's intention than the human author's intention. I think this is where a lot of times hermeneutics gets off is when there's such an emphasis placed on the human authors in Scripture, what they meant. And it's like, well, the New Testament says that the Old Testament writers weren't totally crystal clear on everything as they were writing, but God was. So it's all about the divine author's intention. The Bible, again, is not like any other book. Um, and, uh, and so we just, want to be, we just want to be very clear about this. In regular books, you have the writer, and then you have the reader, and there's a communication. In the Bible, you've got, you've got the writer and the reader, yes, in the original context. So as you're, as you're looking at the scriptures, there was an original setting in which, for instance, Paul was writing to a church, or Moses was writing for the people of Israel. But further, God is the author of all of this, and then he's using what was written in that time to then give it to us all of these years later. So it's different. You know, there, there are just various ways that it's, that it's different. We want to seek God's meaning um, in the very words of Scripture. Secondly, uh, there are historical considerations related to everything that we're saying here. We're learning the historical story in which the biblical message comes to us. So the Bible is indeed uh, a book of history. Uh, it's not an exhaustive history book, thank the Lord, it would be too long. But it is indeed a history and a theological history. God is showing us the history of his working with his people, showing himself, revealing himself progressively over time, redemptively. We could even say covenantally through his relationship with the people of God. He reveals himself uh, and what they need to know about him, about themselves, about the world, and all of that. And we want to we we not only consider the literary matters, uh, the actual words, but we want to consider the historical matters, well, how things were happening and progressing historically. And then thirdly, uh, the third consideration combines the first two, and these can be called uh, revelational considerations. Revelational considerations. This is where we are seeking to understand how the words and the history are used together to convey the truth about God and his redeeming activity. So we're looking at the words, um, we're considering the very words that are used by the human author and the divine author through the human author, written to the original human audience, but then to us all these years later, the very words. And in the original, as we look at the original audience, that, that brings us over into the historical consideration, the progressive a story that's unfolding historically. And when we do these things together, this is helping us to understand what God wants us to know and what God wants us to, uh, to hear from him. Um, and this, I think, leads to uh, what, we're, what we're calling Christ-centered biblical theology. Uh, we're believing this is a historically progressive story whereby God is using words um, given in a context to show us uh, the truth, show us reality. Uh, it's no stretch to say that Christ himself, when you look in the New Testament, how the New Testament treats him, he, that he himself is the one in whom the demand of God upon creation is meant. God makes a demand upon his creation. He expects Adam to obey. Adam doesn't obey. He expects Israel to, to obey. Israel doesn't obey. Um, it's because Israel's fallen. Adam had the propensity to fall, so he did. And so he's looking out over the world and he's saying, he's saying, you know, who, who's going to know me? Who's going to follow me? Who's going to uh, listen to me? But as Isaiah says, then his own arm brought salvation. He himself came into the world, uh, God the Son, the eternal word, and lived the obedient, sinless life. And he's the one in whom the relationship with God is restored and the kingdom is established. He's the true Adam. He's the true Israel. He's the true humanity. Uh, himself, and he indeed is the true temple in whom God and 
uh, people can dwell together. So the story unfolds leading to him. That's why I think Jesus is the center of, uh, of biblical theology. And, and if, we, if, we, if we're seeking to find the meaning of every passage, ultimately um, in terms of its relationship to him and through him to us, then we are respecting uh, what the scripture says about Jesus being uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, uh, the one through whom all creation was made, for whom it was made, and the creator of all things who is the truth. Um, so that being said, I'm going to stop talking here. I've been talking for 20 minutes, and I hope this has been helpful to you. And I hope and pray that, that your thinking is Christ-centered um, and that mine is too. We need his grace for that because none of us has this figured out, but he does. Let me pray, and then I'll let you go. So Lord Jesus, we... Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the work that you've accomplished for us, for loving us deeply. And uh, may we love you in response by um, letting you mold and shape our thinking and our living. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Talk to you soon.